<laughs> All right, I tell you what, why don't we begin and just in general, does anybody have any questions that, oh yes, Mary. No. Huh. You don't believe you ever said that. It, no, I'm not playing Pontius Pilate. I'm playing the, the priest who washed his hands before walking into the Holy of Holies. That's one. The second is, uh, that's also when the collection would come up. And they used to have like pigs and goats and chickens and stuff that they'd donate to the poor. And after handling that, that's when the priest would also wash his hands. Do not, I have told you this. Do not believe what people say in Michigan. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question about something you talked about at Mass on Saturday. Um, I just couldn't remember when I got home. When you said the um, candles on the right and the left of the tabernacle, one was like represented one thing, one represented something, and I couldn't remember what oh. the two. No, I didn't say one represent, and they re both represent. Okay. Um, so the seven branch candle, yeah. can, it's uh, yeah, menorah. Yeah. It symbolizes a lot, like to cut, to make a um, um, covenant, to say make okay. the covenant. In Hebrew, it's cut seven. Okay. But think about it, there's seven gifts of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. There's seven gifts of the um, fruits of the Spirit in the New Testament. So there's all these, like even in the Gospel of John, there's multiple sevens. Okay. Uh, there's multiple sevens in the Old Testament. Like John loves the number seven. There's seven, 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 seven. So the first seven is a seven in the Old Testament. The second seven is the seven in the New Testament. Okay. Okay. Thank so. You have 15 questions. When are you going to answer the ones you didn't get? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is actually a real... Um, I just don't have time, so what I'm going to do is simply record the answers and then put them on the website, because typing takes too long. So, so I'm just going to do it that way. So, when I remember. That's funny. I thought about that. Um, I thought about with, the, but I don't like the whole purpose of the mass of questions was. Um, just to get people, not really supply answers, actually just to have people start saying, well, why do we do that? And I never noticed, and why is that over there? Um, it just makes them take ownership of the church and the liturgy. And then later, I need to look at my calendar. What I want to do is do um, like a teaching mass for one month. Um, so just like, um, we'll still have a homily. The homily will just be like three minutes. You barely get any sleep. Um, <laughs> but then it just take the four parts of Mass and um, why we do what we do. So I'm going to do that too. Great but, and the reason why is that, yeah, you guys come to adult ed, but if you really think, you're a tiny fraction of the entire parish. Mm -hmm. um, so the only way to really teach is if we do, devote Sunday mm -hmm. time to it. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, now on to the Gospel of John. So we're doing the sixth and seventh sign. Um, and the sixth sign is the man born blind. And it starts with this discourse of water and light. And it's, oh, this is drives me up the walls. So um, it's the Feast of Tabernacles. And John keeps saying what feast it is that's being celebrated. Now it's a Feast of Tabernacles or booths. Um, and it's commemoration of their traveling in the desert. And I mentioned this, um, I think I might have mentioned this, but on the Feast of Tabernacles, when I was living in LA, I was walking to the gym and um, I noticed all these apartment buildings, all these people camping in their patio. Did I ever tell you that story? Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, well, why, why are people camping on their patio? And it was so slow. And especially since I have a degree in liturgy. And then I realized it. Oh, it's Feast of Tabernacles. And think about that. When they were traveling in the desert, they would have been homeless. And I just think this is amazing. So think about this. If you're a faithful Jew, for um, a couple days every year, you have to remember that your ancestors were homeless. 
Isn't that kind of amazing? Mm -hmm. um, we so, still are. <laughs> in one sense, we still are. Our real home is heaven. That is true. Um, no, this sounds kind of strange. Just these liturgical feasts. Um, he's here, by the way. Um, uh, just in case you didn't know. Um, that's your husband. Don't look at him. <laughs> um, doesn't like attention. Um, this sounds kind of strange, but you know, I this is my belief. Part of the definition of a citizen for democracy to work, if you look at the Greek notion, is that you have to participate. Democracy, if you're a citizen, you have to vote. You have to pay taxes. But um, you have to participate if democracy is going to work. And I don't know if you saw those like Jimmy Kimmel videos of um, interviewing millennials. They're driving up the wall. <laughs> because they're interviewing them and it's, you know, the camera's on and it's, are you going to vote? No, it's, it's just too hard. The voting booth is right there. I'm more of a surfer. <laughs> but, and the notion of what it means to be a citizen is I exist for myself. And if you're wondering, what, what does that have to do? John paints a picture of Jesus always paint, participating in the seven Jewish feasts. That Jesus, he's making the point, Jesus is the feast. Jesus is the very meaning of this feast. In the same way, uh, the word citizen doesn't mean, that, um, doesn't mean that you live by yourself. You pay taxes, you vote, you participate. Now the word spiritual means I don't have to believe in organized religion or worship together. I follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you want to say, for the love of God. <laughs> Read the Gospel of John. He's always participating in the feast. Um, and this is a feast of um, uh, booze. So Jesus and John, he is very critical of organized religion. But nowhere does he advocate leaving it. In fact, quite the opposite. He would say, I am the feast. And the Feast of um, uh, Tabernacles, it's a water libation. And what that means is this. So on the Feast of Tabernacles, the high priest would go to the Pool of Salaam. That's going to come up in the next story. Go to the Pool of Salaam, and in this golden pitcher, he would take water, there's this procession back, and they pour it on the altar. And it recalls it. Remember that when they're in the desert, um, there's water from the rock? Uh, it recalls that. It recalls their homelessness, that when they were homeless and thirsty, God's the one who gave them water. So it's this water offering that's called a libation. And if you remember from the first class, and hopefully you didn't forget, um, uh, before Jesus, the temple had become very corrupt. One guy uh, names himself king and high priest, even though he doesn't. And he doesn't care about liturgy. He only cares about power. So during this festival, he takes the water from the golden pitcher, and he doesn't really care about liturgy, he doesn't know what's going on, he takes the water and pours it on the ground. And remember, the people get so upset because you're supposed to pour the water over the altar. It's a feast of water and light, and the light and the water purify the altar. Um, symbolizes the, this prophecy that um, water will flow from the temple. So it's this purification rite, and he poured it on the land because he just didn't care. And the people take, they have these palm branches with kind of what's lemon citrons. They take them and they start to throw them at um, Alexander, the high priest and king. But he's not taking this. So he slaughters 3,000 of them. Um, but <clears throat> it just shows how corrupt, you know, they can do the ritual, but there's this corruption. So it's water that purifies and it's light that purifies. So what they would do on the Feast of Tabernacles is take this huge candle and put it in the courtyard of the Gentiles and they'd fuel it with huge amounts of oil. And Josephus, the Roman historian, says it was so enormous and so bright that it would light up the entire city of Jerusalem at night. And it recalls the pillar of fire that led them uh, to the Promised Land. And just FYI, where do you find that in our church? The Easter candle. The Easter, the Easter candle. candle. That huge candle. Um, we use it at Easter. And as you can guess, uh, 
This is a place where Jesus says that he is the living water, that he is the light of the world. Um, and the story starts off with this really odd thing about his brothers. When it says brothers, by the way, in Hebrew, there's no way to say, there's no word for cousin. Um, you would just call all of them your brothers and sisters. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's extended family. And his family, who doesn't quite get him, asks if he's going to go, uh, that he should just go up publicly and create a stir. And he says that he's not going up to the, to the feast. It's not his time to be, quote unquote, lifted up. But then if you read the next set, verse, he actually goes in secret. So did Jesus lie or not lie? No, because remember the whole theme is lifted up. When it says lifted up, he means many things at once. Lifted up means being lifted up on the cross. It means ascending to heaven. Uh, it means resurrection. Um, and so lifted up has this whole theology behind it. Um, he goes to the temple and he starts to preach. But when he starts to preach, he discusses the Sabbath. So back to the Sabbath issue. And some people say, you know, this is wrong, by the way, absolutely no work on the Sabbath. And Jesus is about to heal somebody on the Sabbath. And he says, well, that doesn't make any sense because you judge by appearances. Actually, what he says is, you judge according to the flesh and without right judgment. And he says, even in Judaism, this is true, if you, you get circumcised on the eighth day, so if the eighth day is a Sabbath, you still do the circumcision. So Jesus says right then and there, God is still at work on the Sabbath. Why wouldn't I be? Um, and I love their reply. They'll say this several times in the Gospel of John, and they'll say, you are a demon. Like, that's pretty amazing. In the Gospel of John, several times they want to both stone him, and they call him a demon. And the reason why I love that is that Think about this. The whole theme here is light. Can you really see? Can you really recognize other people or not? And they can't. And at the end of the feast, that's when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Now, just FYI, that's also in the Old Testament, in Psalm 27. And it says, Yahweh is the light of the world. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, it's also an, yet another, he always does this, backwards way of saying, he is Yahweh. And just as the candle uh, illuminates the city, Jesus is the true light of the world, is what he says. And then there's more discussion about Jesus giving, uh, being the living water. Um, and to me, this strikes of our uh, baptism symbolism, because he says he's living water, which means flowing water. You know, Catholics, yet you can baptize either immersion or submersion, but it's got to be immersion, where the water flows. But also in baptism, you're given a candle because the Holy Spirit is burning inside of you. Um, so um, the next sign will deal with water and light. Um, it's a man born blind. So that's the next one. But then all of a sudden, there's all this talk about Jesus being the light of the world, but then, in this really weird way, they insert this gospel story about the woman being caught in adultery. Now, we know that in the really ancient, handwritten um, uh, gospel of John stories, you know what's missing? The story of the adulterous woman mm -hmm. is floating around in other sources, but then later it was inserted into the gospel of John. So, was the story of the adulterous woman true? Probably. But remember, John is not telling all the stories of Jesus, just the ones that is making this point. So the very fact that they inserted it here in this discussion of light, it's about, light is also about make, being able to make a judgment. Does that make sense? Who can truly see and who can't see? And that's kind of the theme of the adulterous woman. Because it's a feast of booze and Jesus is starting to teach, don't judge by appearances. If Jesus is the light, he can see everything. We can only see a little bit. Then there's this question about if he's the Christ. Um, and then the original, oh, sorry, the religious authorities want to kill him again. So suddenly there's a story of the adulterous woman. 
And it fits because the religious authorities can't even see Christ, can't even recognize God. And they, they say they want to stone Christ. They want to put God to death. And likewise, they want to put to death anybody who they regard as a sinner. So they get the woman caught in adultery. Jesus says he's the light of the world, but he also says the religious authorities are the ones that are most blind. In chapter 940, Jesus says, the Pharisees, they can't even see their own sins. A lot of people say that they're religious. You know, that's kind of the theme of the Gospel of John. A lot of people say that they're religious, but they're really not living in the light. They reject the truth. They use religion as a show, but not really as enlightenment. Um, so in the middle of this talk about light and judgment, you have this story of the woman caught in adultery. It's a great story. I, I don't know if you guys read it, know it, but so they want to create this situation to accuse Jesus, right? That Jesus is too forgiving. So they haul this woman who's caught in the very act of adultery, quote unquote. The problem is, if you read the Bible, it's actually got to be both people. I, I don't know if you notice this, you can't commit adultery by yourself. So, where's the God? You know, they're not concerned about justice. They're just dragging her to shame her. And they throw her in the middle, um, and they ask, is it lawful or not to stone her? Remember, they ju it just said they were trying to stone Jesus. Um, um, so anyhow, um, this is kind of interesting. So Jesus, um, you know, he makes that great line, let the one without sin cast the first stone, and the older people drop their stones first, because we know the older you get, the bigger a sinner you are. <laughs> um, and I'm only slightly kidding. Um, because, to be honest, the older you get, the better you should, you know, the better you should get at seeing your own sins. I mean, I, I'm really kind of serious on that. Um, like, it is kind of true. Go and listen to people's confessions. You know, I'll let this cat on the bag. You know, um, every second grader, you know what they confess? Lying. Lying to their mother. For some reason, it's always their mother. Lying to their mother and fighting with their brother and sister. They are little liars. Um, but they can only judge sin by reaction. You know, like, they know there's a, a, a scuffle, and that's how they recognize sin. But, you know, then, and this is amazing, when you start to get um, grade school girls who later on will say things like, I'm jealous. Like, that's far more internal. And usually when you have older people's confession, it's really um, nebulous things, things in your heart. Does that make sense? It's not lying to your mother anymore. It isn't just the big... The older you get, you should be able to see sin. And so the elderly people um, drop their stones first. And it says Jesus twice is riding in the, the dust. Well, you know, everything Jesus does is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it says God will write their sins before them in the dust. In Jeremiah, it says their sins will be written before them in the earth because they have rejected the fountain of the living water. Um, so it makes this connection with him just saying, I am living water, I am the light. Does that make, like, you say, oh, that fulfills testimony. And uh, so they drop it and walk away. Now, the story is not really about forgiveness. It's about being non-condemning. Does that, like, I'm just trying to see my own sins, not judge everybody else's. Um, if Jesus is the light of the world and you operate by light, then you're more interested in seeing your own sins and convicting somebody else. Over and over, they keep wanting to stone Jesus. So then, Jesus, does that make any sense? Did I lose anybody? So then Jesus gets into this strange discussion uh, Jesus is Abraham and the Lamb of God. He calls them children of the devil because they only want to bring more death, murder, into the world and then call themselves religious. And remember in the very prologue, 
Either you're a child of the light or you're a child of the darkness. And Jesus says this strange line where he says, Abraham saw my day. What? What does it mean? Abraham saw my day. Abraham lived in Neolithic times, uh, just on the end of caveman days. In a sense, Jesus is saying that he knew Jesus because he is the Logos. Oh, sorry, Jesus knew Abraham because he is the Logos. He's existed before all time. But there's this hidden message when Jesus says, Abraham saw my day. When did Abraham, think about this, when did Abraham see Jesus' day? Isaac. Isaac, yes. Remember the story of the uh, Akedah, the sacrifice of Isaac? Mm -hmm. Just as a recap, just in case people forget, Isaac is this Christ-like figure. Because how old is Isaac? 33. Um, who, carried the, who carried the wood to the sacrifice? Um, uh, there's all this symbolism, right? And um, at one point, Isaac knows something's wrong. So he asks Abraham, he says, where is the Lamb of God? And Abraham literally says, God will provide himself, the lamb. What does that mean? God himself will provide the lamb. That means, does, does that mean God himself will provide the lamb or that God will provide himself as the lamb? And we'd say both. And remember, a lamb never died. Um, Isaac didn't either. Ram does. So when they blow the shofar, it's to call you know, to remind God, um, you still have to send us the Lamb of God. It's a story of a father who offers his son and a son who is willing to be sacrificed. Isaac said, um, when he said, um, when Abraham says, God himself will provide the Lamb, that's when Isaac says, here I am. He, he's willing to be sacrificed. Um, and it happens at the same place um, at Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah, it's the same place as a Temple Mount. It's also called Calvary. So the land of Moriah is this larger area where the Temple Mount is, Calvary is, and Jerusalem is. Mount Moriah is where you also, um, it's named that because of this um, <coughs> thorn bush that produces myrrh, this ointment for death. So Abraham looks forward to the day in which the Lord will provide the sacrifice of his only son. The problem is, as I said, Abraham is not a lamb. He's a full-grown man. Um, the shofar means that. And the place has this double meaning. Abraham in Hebrew calls the mountain, the name of the mountain, Abraham, where Isaac, where they killed the ram, is in Hebrew, it says, the Lord shall provide. But in Hebrew, there's a double meaning. It can mean either the Lord shall provide or it can mean the Lord has seen. Well, if you take the Lord has seen, Jesus is saying that he is the Lamb of God called for. He is the sacrifice of the Son Abraham said God himself will provide. Um, there, Abraham says God will provide and the Lord shall be seen. Christ is in this saying where Abraham saw my day. It's this fulfillment of all these Hebrew words that he's saying he is the Lamb of God. And then he says, before Abraham was, I am. Making this still, this other reference that he's the pre-existing Logos. Um, so once again, once he says that, um, uh, they pick up stones and they want to kill him. Now, the odd part is Jesus really doesn't get along with religious people. I hate to say, religious people um, still get upset with Christ. In this sense, they keep taming Christ down. They tame Christ down that, you know, Christ is just this really friendly guy. Um, not that he's not friendly, but he points out our own blindness. And I just don't think a lot of religious people want to practice a religion where they have to look at their own sins. And really, I swear to God. Um, so, yeah, they'd rather just do away with Christ and call themselves religious. So, 
Objections, complaints? <coughs> too boring? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, we don't know. He's either 33 or 38, depending upon um, how you calculate it. You take when how old Abraham was to the Akedah, and the numbers, for some reason, Jew Judaism isn't really clear. But you just have to take the age of Sarah and Abraham when Isaac was born versus at the when he sacrificed. So it's obviously a real story about the God who will sacrifice himself. So it was the beginning of a covenant that ends with all the nations of the world will be blessed because of the sacrifice, which they are not all blessed yet because they're not all Christian. Well, it, the Gospel of John always um, says there's a choice. You're not forced into Christianity. And all nations have been blessed. Look how many nations there are here. I'm Scotch-Irish. Um, you're... Norwegian. What? Irish, Irish Norwegian. Irish, Irish Norwegian. There's no such thing. Um, <laughs> you're probably German, Polish. You know what I mean? Like, all the nations have been blessed. It doesn't mean every single person in every single nation will choose the light. Make disciples of all nations. And they, well, all know, nations are here. But not everyone in every nation. But like, seriously. So he doesn't really honor borders. <laughs> no, he doesn't. There are no borders. No, God wants everybody part of the family of God. Okay, so after this becomes the, sorry, it took me all together, the um, sixth sign, and that is the pool of Salam, the man born blind. Um, and it's another, remember, um, we're on the downside. So it's another um, healing of a pool of water. The other one was sign three, uh, where the man was healed, uh, the lame man was healed. Um, but he, in number three, sign number three, the man, the lame man is healed, but he's not converted. In fact, he betrays Christ. In meal number six, the man born blind, he's not only healed, but afterwards he's persecuted by religious officials. And that's when he comes to believe in Jesus and quote unquote worships him. He comes to really believe in Jesus when he has to defend Jesus. Now this pool of Salaam, remember every word, every little thing means something. The pool, actually I think this is amazing. Um, for hundreds of years people said, well, John doesn't know what he's talking about. There is no pool of Salaam in Jerusalem. Um, well, it was recently discovered. So I just find that kind of amazing. Well, there is a pool of Salaam, and it's the size of a football field. And it's this huge, in Hebrew, it's a mitzvah, and that's uh, for rites of purification before you go into the um, uh, Jerusalem. So it's this huge pool that people would go to for uh, purification. Um, the idea is um, it's getting purified for the religious feast. In case you miss it, Jesus is the true pool where we're purified. And there's a blind man there. And Jesus combines spit and earth, mud, to make, um, well, I'll say clay, but we'd say mud. Um, notice Jesus heals through physical things, mud and spit. And the Pharisees get really upset because Jesus does this on a Sabbath. And just FYI, um, if you think about the Sabbath, um, there's a lot of hints there. Because in Genesis, God made mankind from clay and then puts his spirit into us. So Jesus makes clay with spit, which is, think of this, it's the water of Christ. You say the Holy Spirit, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and dirt. Well, remember in Genesis, um, God scooped up Ha Adama, the earth, and blew uh, his spirit into him. So the man is washing in the pool of Salam. Salam in uh, the Hebrew means one who is sent. So it's a highly symbolic, rich, um, 
overtones. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Another word for baptism in the Bible is enlightenment. And his eyes are enlightened to see. So he's washed in the pool that bears the name of Christ. But also, if you remember Genesis, um, um, humanity is made of um, water and dirt. So in Jesus doing this again, it's this image of recreation. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's several descriptions of mankind made of quote-unquote earth, um, made of earth and the spittle of God. So clearly there's another connection between the Gospel of John and the seen community of the Dead Sea Scrolls because they're using the exact phrase. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so, but also, um, to hear that Jesus made clay and spit and put on the blank... Blind, man, blind man's eyes, that would evoke this image of recreation. Um, in fact, they unearthed this very ancient baptismal font, and this passage was written upon it of making um, spit with clay and opened his eyes. That's where our eyes are open. Now, as I said, the pool of Salam also means one who is sent, and that's a description of Christ. Um, in Hebrew, the word um, shalak, shalak, it's shalak, shalak in Hebrew means sent or one who is sent. And so a shalak is this. If um, uh, it's a it's a technical term, so I want to explain. So let's say I'm a father, and I'm um, I'm old and half blind. I can only see out of one eye. I'm balding. I can appoint like somebody as my shaliak. So let's say I appoint Rob as my shaliak. And I can't make the distance to go travel somewhere, but I can imbue him with all my authority. So that's called a shaliak, or quote unquote, one who is sent. So um, if Rob showed up, he could enter into any legal contracts and it would have as if I was doing it. That's one who is sent. And Christ keeps saying he is a shaliak. Um, uh, just so he's the one who is sent. Also, just FYI, this is kind of an important word in Catholicism <coughs> because what what is the translation of an apostle? What what does the word mass mean? Sent. Apostle means sent. Mass means sent. Uh, it's a very Catholic word. And Jesus keeps referring. Um, 24 times he says that he's a shaliak. 60 times in the Gospel of John, he uses a derivative of that. And by derivative, I mean this. Um, like he says, Jesus says, Jesus said, my bread is to do the will of the one who sent me. Um, I cannot do anything on my own. I I judge as I hear. My judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the one who sent me. Jesus said, I will be with you a little bit longer, and then I will go to the one who sent me. As you send me into the world, so I, as you have sent me into the world, I send you into the world. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. I could go on. But any time in the Gospel of John, if you use that word 24 times and then 60 times as a derivative, you know it's a really important word. So Jesus is the shaliak, the one who sent. And the name of the pool is one who is sent. And this is really odd. In the Gospel of John, John avoids calling anybody a son except for Jesus. For other people, he'll use the word child. The son and the shilia are connected. The son is the shiliac of the father. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why he never, the only one he calls son is really technically Jesus. Everybody else is called a child. Um, so the pool, um, Jesus, uh, anyhow, um, it's also feed, fed by the Gihon spring. That's one of the um, springs in Jerusalem, but it's also mentioned in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. So once again, if we were ancient Jews, knowing that the Gihon fed into the pool of one who was sent, um, you would think, oh, it's recreation. The man is washed in the one who was sent. The Messiah is sent from God. 
Um, does that make sense? And after he's washed, after he goes and washes the clay off, there's this amazing thing. People can't completely recognize the new man. They'll say it's him, but he looks different. Do you get the baptismal connection? In baptism, we're kind of the same, but we're also not the same. And they ask him, and this is the only place this happens in the Gospel of John, they'll ask him, are you the blind man? And he says, I am. Now what's important about that, remember I am means Yahweh. Um, Jesus, over and over and over, keeps using I am statements. This is the only time somebody who's not Jesus says I am. But it fits with his baptismal um, image. Does that make sense? After baptism, we're part of the great I am. I am one with Christ. Does that make any sense? Okay. okay. So, and you can see. And an ancient term for baptism is enlightenment. But, okay, so this miracles happen. And remember in sign number three, the guy gets in terror, the guy betrays Jesus. And this miracle, the guy also gets interrogated. They bring him and his parents, and his parents are scared of the religious officials. They are terrified. So they throw their son under the bus. I think that would have been my parents. But, um, <laughs> and then they interrogate the blind man, who now can see. And I, this is great theater, because the man's kind of a flippant comedian. You know, when they're interrogating, he says, if you're so interested in Jesus, maybe you want to be his disciple. Um, and they call on God to curse the man. And the odd part is, he's not cursed. Uh, he's actually blessed. Not only does he see, but think about this. The blind man, did he, he ever see Jesus? No. No, because remember he had clay on his, his eyes. And then he goes and washes it off. So the first thing he would have seen is his own hands. Um, he would have never really seen Jesus. It's only, and this is the key, it's only after having defended Jesus that he makes a profession of faith and then sees Jesus. To me, this is not only an image of baptism, it's an image of confirmation. Jesus says he's the light of the world, light to the blind. Um, and Jesus also said he shows those who think that they can see that they're in the dark. Um, and, um, you know, they, there's this great talk about, like, um, well, who sinned? Was it his parents who sinned? Um, and Jesus dismisses those as worthless questions. Um, but it's about this enlightenment awakening. The guy has this enlightenment, not just to physically see, but he has an enlightenment about himself. He moves. Notice he moves from several things. He moves from being a beggar to a prophet. He moves from blindness to enlightenment. He was a beggar and a victim. And then he's enlightened and stands up to really religious bullies. The man moves from darkness into light, see, while the religious officials are having the opposite movement. The more they persecute, the more, more they move into darkness. And Jesus will say that blindness is not a sin, but claiming to be enlightened when you're not, Jesus says that is a great sin. So you have this enlightenment about himself. Now, just FYI, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Why would that be about confirmation? Remember, baptism is about you being enlightened, that the presence of the Holy Spirit burns inside of you. We're all connected. Confirmation is you recognizing your own gifts. Mm -hmm. Confirmation is this awareness of who you are and who Christ is and your role <coughs> in the world. So to be honest, I think this is more about confirmation. And he gets enlightened about, there's this enlightenment not just about himself, but about who Christ is. First, he calls Jesus a man. Then he calls Jesus a prophet. And then he calls him, quote unquote, from God. And then Lord. And it says he ends up worshiping him. Um, Lord is a worship term. And I love the fact that they can't quite recognize the blind beggar afterwards. We're, when we're enlightened, we're kind of changed. Um, we're the same person, unfortunately. But um, 
when Christ is resurrected, they also can't quite recognize him. He's different. Um, it's the Pharisees. They don't see any recreation. All they ever see is sin. Um, making clay is a lot of work, and therefore, Jesus has sinned by making clay on the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath is really not about the lack of worth. It's about freedom. Sabbath technically is this revolution. Um, it means freedom from slavery. When we celebrate the Sabbath, we celebrate for one day, I am nobody's master. I'm completely set free. I don't have to do your work. I have to do that on Monday. Um, it's the Pharisees who are blind. They claim religious enlightenment, but they have this very mechanistic view of theology. Um, Pharisees, they can't recon reconcile the experience, um, so they simply often choose to ignore the experience of goodness. Um, they choose blindness. They, um, like, I know this sounds kind of strange. Uh, I hate to say this, religious people do this all the time, because they just don't want to recognize the goodness. Like, you would, I, this happened last week where somebody, I got an argument because somebody said, well, you know, divorced people shouldn't be going to communion. Um, like, really, are you that blind that all you can see is sin? Divorced people, it's remarriage that's actually a problem, not divorced. But the Pharisees, they replied to Jesus, surely you're not saying I'm blind. And Jesus says, if you were blind, you are blind, since uh, you say we have not sinned, therefore you're blind. People can't see their own sins, they really are blind. Um, and why is it always those who say that they're sinless who are always so great at recognizing other people's sins? Um, it's, it's another pairing. Um, anyhow, I like how when the parents are getting interrogated, they're scared, but they keep pushing the discussion back to the experience of goodness. The Pharisees want to discredit the experience. Was he really born blind? Um, they question the man and he gives this flippant answer. The blind man uh, wants to argue about the experience. How can you say Jesus is a sinner when he does such good things? There, the Pharisees' response is, how dare you argue with theology with us? We have degrees and you're a sinner. They don't want to deal with the experience. Does that make sense? They're st only stuck in their definition, so they cast him out, which is going to be reminiscent of us being excommunicated from Judaism. Um, and then the guy meets Jesus again, and this is where I think the symbol of confirmation is. Remember the man never saw Jesus, um, but Jesus comes back, and that's when he puts it all together. And I like how when he mentions faith, and this is the Gospel of John. Faith, p pistis, is never a noun in the Gospel of John. It's always used as a verb. Faith is something, not something you do in your head. That's what the Pharisees are doing. You know, they have a clear definition of right in their head. Faith, uh, trust, is something that you do with your actions in your life. And confirmation is putting your gift back to God and even defending the faith. It puts faith into action. So, um, no offense, when certain Christians say, all you need is faith, that doesn't make sense in the Gospel of John. Seeing the signs of Jesus doesn't mean anybody has faith. Putting the sign into action does. This guy, not only does he gain sight, he really sees Jesus when he has to defend um, the faith. Does that make sense? Because there's all these reactions to the sign. I don't know if that made sense, but um, just... Uh, okay, questions, objections, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Rob? One of the things I, I see a real strong connection with, once you're baptized, and, and I, I mean, I think, I look at the cross and the resurrection as, as a baptism. Uh, once you're baptized, you're a different person, and so the disciples on Emmaus don't recognize him. Mary thinks he's a gardener. I mean, there's something different about you once you're baptized. Uh, I, I look at the connections between all of the times that Jesus walks away from people who would kill him. He walks through their midst that they don't recognize him. I mean, if you're not in the light, if you don't have faith, you won't recognize him. 
And I wonder how many people I walk by every day who I don't recognize. Well, that's a great line. He says, um, so repeat what he said. I have to edit it down because I kind of forget. <laughs> Remember, um, like in Emmaus, they can't recognize Jesus. Nobody can kind of recognize Jesus. They can't recognize that guy. But if you're in the light, you recognize other people. And so his last line was good. He says, so I wonder, how many times do I walk, walk past people and not recognize them? Mm-hmm. So, That's really good. good. That is good. Okay, moving on, we didn't get very far. Um, after this, you have the Good Shepherd Discourse, where Jesus says, so he said, I am the light, and he also says, I am the Good Shepherd. Um, which is kind of amazing, because the Pharisees just called Jesus, for another time, um, a demon. And his reply is, can a demon open eyes? It's the Pharisees whose eyes Jesus can't open. <coughs> Now, the odd part is Pharisees were despised at the time of the Pharisees. Um, sh- oh, sorry. Shepherds are despised at the time of the Pharisees because they can't keep all the religious rules. Granted, in ancient Judaism, to be a shepherd like King David was great. But the Pharisees, they didn't like shepherds since they couldn't keep all the purity laws. Um, so when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he's succeeding King David. Um, but it also, you have all these prophecies that in the Old Testament is quite clear. Several times, Yahweh is the shepherd. So when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, it's another way of saying, I am Yahweh. But in the prophets, God gets very angry because he's appointed the priests, the shepherds, but they just fleece the sheep. They don't defend the sheep. They don't, does that make any sense? So... Um, Anyhow, so there's this prophecy that when Messiah comes, he'll, he'll shepherd the sheep, and he'll have other priests that will shepherd the priests. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll make other shepherds. Um, when he says he's the good shepherd, the contrast is um, he's fulfilling this Old Testament prophecy that God will shepherd his people, and a shepherd feeds his sheep. So that's a Eucharistic image. Um, but you know, the amazing part is this. Jesus says, and I, this is a great line, or profound line. He says to the apostles, I have sheep that do not belong to this fold, and they hear my voice, and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. Um, so the controversial part about that is that, have you ever thought people in other religions, Buddhism, um, I don't know, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Minnesotans, um, they may be able to hear the voice of Christ. They may be part of the flock of Christ. We might not recognize them, but to be a sh- uh, he's the shepherd, and they hear my voice. The people that don't hear Christ's voice, oddly enough, are the Pharisees and the religious authorities. And I didn't know this. I really don't know sheep well, but there's a story of um, this priest told that when he was in the Middle East, he had um, saw this Bedouin shep- uh, shepherd riding a bike, calling to his sheep, and they were running right after him. And that's when he says, oh, wow, sheep can recognize your voice. I didn't know that. Um, and if you're a bad shepherd or a thief, um, what you could do to another shepherd is try and let their sheep out at night, and the sheep will disperse. But the thieves can't steal them all because... The sheep don't recognize the thief's voice. So you, have to, you can always steal as many as you can bind up. Um, and the religious leaders are binding up the sheep. They're shearing the sheep for themselves. Um, okay. He also says, I am the sheep gate. So I'm the light. I am the... Oh, uh, I am... No, I was trying to go in order. What's the first one? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the shepherd. He also says he's a sheep gate. What that means by that, this is that. Really, Christ is the only way to God the Father. The only way into heaven is through Christ. Um, I know that upsets people, but um, we'd say, well, no, Christ is the only way. In the same way the sheep 
All sheep can hear his voice, even if they're a different religion. I have sheep that do not belong to this fold. They're still going through Christ, even though they don't know the name of Christ. Wouldn't they be referring to, like, the Gentiles and things? Yes, that refers to us. But it may refer to a lot more than just us. Okay. But the Father? Yeah. Isn't it true, though, that sheep are basically mindless? They, they are completely lost without the voice. I have no idea how mindless the well. sheep are. <laughs> no, I really don't, because, like, Susan Garcia... And she's a bass girl, so you know you don't mess with them. Um, she said to me, she said, because she, she has sheep, and she said, um, please do not say sheep are stupid. Because she has sheep, and she says, sheep are actually really smart. But maybe she trains her sheep. <laughs> maybe they're scared of her. I don't know. But no, I had heard that, 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 that the relationship of the voice and the sheep is because they don't know what to do without a voice, without someone who takes command of them. Mm, I, I like the idea that they don't know what to do without the voice. I like that. I don't know if it's true, but I, I like it. Yeah. Right, does anybody know sheep well? <laughs> anybody has any personal relationship with sheep? <laughs> Okay, Jane is nodding her head, so it's true. The taste. I like the taste, too. Um, okay, the only problem is we're almost at an hour, so um, do you want to press on or not? Um, but I tell you what, so I was going to have you guys discuss, and we're not going to. Like, but think about this when you leave. Like, the man's eyes were truly open to recognize himself and Christ once he has to defend his faith. So, here's my question. When were your eyes open to really true faith, who Christ is, when you had a fight for the faith? Like, um, I know this sounds kind of strange, it sounds horrible, but um, like I noticed this in Idaho Falls, the kids in Idaho Falls, they kind of knew their catechism. Because they're so surrounded by Mormons, they have to defend it. Um, I think sometimes your eyes are really open, not at the pool, but when you have to defend it. So think in your own life. When, when did you really come to believe in your faith because you had to defend it? Um, so not going to discuss that now, but there you go. Um, Jesus then says another controversial thing where he says, I and the Father of one. After talking about this relationship with his sheep, he talks about his relationship with the Father. That he loves me for I lay down my life. Um, he's not caught up like the religious authorities um, into who to execute, who to put down, but really this oneness uh, with God the Father. So at the portico of Solomon, they ask him if he's the Christ. And I love where he says, I have told you, you just can't hear my voice. <laughs> um, so they want to stone him again. My gosh, it's just a bad day. Um, <laughs> but in that dialogue, um, uh, he says, I have shown you many good works. For which of these good works are you stoning me? And then he says this strange line where he says, you are called gods. Now, most people misinterpret this. Um, but Jesus says, you are, all, sorry, you are all called gods. You are all gods. I mention this because Mormons will use this phrase to prove, no, we are all meant to be gods. But that's taking it out of context. It's a reference to the Old Testament where those who misjudge right and wrong call themselves God. It's like living out the Genesis image where I get to proclaim, define what is good and what is you know, that's the sin of the Garden of Eden. They're living out this temptation of the Garden of Eden by being like gods because they get to make up their own definitions of right and wrong. So when Jesus says, you are all gods, he's quoting the Old Testament. But what it means is those who think they can judge right or wrong make themselves gods. It doesn't mean we're all going to become gods of our own planet. And they accuse Jesus of blasphemy, and Jesus is accusing them of blasphemy. Um, and then he goes into this, the Father and I are one. Now immediately when it says, the Father and I are one, you should think of the Shema prayer. Mm -hmm. Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. I shall love the Lord your God with all my heart, all my strength, and all my mind. Um, and then he mentions his hours again. Um, 
And so they try and stone him. They try and kill him. So that leads into the seventh sign. There's only seven signs. Is That is, the seventh sign is Lazarus. Um, they're raising a Lazarus from the dead. And this is going to bring about, quote unquote, his hour. It's not, his hour didn't start at the first sign, the wedding of Cana. His hour is going to be instigated by actually Lazarus. Now, the Lazarus story talks of, first starts um, about talking about Mary. This is really strange. If you read it, it talks about Lazarus, and then it jumps forward several ahead of time. And it'll say, Lazarus, the brother of Mary, who will anoint Jesus. But that happens in the next chapter. So why does John mention it now? That image of Mary um, anointing Jesus uh, means that she's giving herself away. She, you know, dries his feet with his hair, means she doesn't care about dignity. That anointing part means religion in the Gospel of John is not a, not a balance seat where God says, oh, okay, you're adding up, you're doing okay. For John, religion is a static love. Remember the first sign. The seventh sign and the first sign kind of match. Um, religion is about this love affair with God. Um, also, religion is this ecstatic love. Love is com uh, religion is completely giving your life out of love for other people. And in this story, we're supposed to be Martha, who believes love is stronger than death. Martha does not believe faith is a balance sheet. So Jesus gets news of Lazarus dying, and the really odd part is that he waits for two days. He waits another two days. Um, so you'd say, well, why? Um, Lazarus is not dead. He's just completely dead. Um, that's what it means. Um, four days, so I know this says four days, it was Jewish idea that uh, the spirit could hover around for three days. So you have to wait three days to make sure somebody is completely dead. On the fourth day, they'd be completely dead. Did you guys see the movie The Princess Bride? Yeah. Where... Who, who's seen it? Oh, you guys, that's such a cute funny. Yeah. Anyhow, um, he has to revive somebody who's dead. And this kind of old magician doctor says, Ah, oh, he's mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and completely dead. <laughs> um, so Jesus waits until Lazarus is completely dead. Um, sorry. I have a question. Yeah. Um, but I also, I thought it was three days because I thought that also tied in with the um, right. uh, crucifixion and then Easter is three days. So that Jesus would be completely dead before he <coughs> was raised, before he raised them, you know. And now you're saying it's four. Yeah. I, I thought. No. Th that's, that's, there's the Jesus is never completely dead. Yeah, I know that. But I thought for the crucifixion. <laughs> no, it's three days. Okay. Uh, four days. Uh, three days that body, the spirit could hover around. Here's the odd part. The story starts with, it, it's such a subtlety, you'll miss it. Um, when Martha hears that Jesus is coming, he runs, she runs out of the home to greet him. What you don't know is that that breaks Jewish law. So um, it breaks Jewish law. A woman is not allowed to greet a man in public unless he's married to her. So the fact that she's doing it means she doesn't care about these silly, made-up religious rules. Does that make any sense? And like, I'm more traditional. I just believe it should be that way today. But <laughs> I believe this country went downhill when women were given the right to drive. But um, uh, joking, kind of. No, I am joking. Um, <laughs> What do you mean they picked up coffee cups and threw it at me? Um, um, the odd part, Martha, Martha says, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. Really? Here's the odd part. Jesus is not here to stop us from dying. He's here to raise us to new life. Yet she believes Christ has the power to raise him to life. So she's kind of half right and half wrong. Uh, and when he... When, um, John shows Christ as a shepherd, and you know that line, Martha goes to Mary and says, the teacher is here, he's calling for you. 
And Mary, who's a perfect sheep, immediately responds. Um, actually, it says he told her, she, Martha told Mary in secret, the teacher's here and he's calling for you. The word secret means inner heart. Um, so then Martha is talking to Jesus and the encounter of Martha and her confession of Jesus is pretty amazing. In Matthew, Peter proclaims that Jesus is, you are the Christ. But in John, you know one who proclaims Jesus is the Christ? Martha, Martha not Peter. Why is that? And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. In Matthew, uh, he says, you are the Christ, and he's given keys to the kingdom. In John, you are the Christ, is tied into the belief of the resurrection. So why do you think it is that John reports to Martha a woman who proclaims Jesus is the Christ rather than Peter? So remember I told you John's gospel is a mystical gospel? Um, John's making this, he keeps making it, you just might not notice it. John's not, not anti-institutional, but the institutional church doesn't have all the answers. So it's not really putting down Peter. It's <coughs> say the ones who really know Christ, it's a mystical knowledge, not an ecclesial power that gets you to that knowledge. Does that make sense? So, go ahead. I've always thought it was more of a wedding imagery than, than anything else. Um, the cross is, is a wedding, um, and Jesus, or, or Martha, is running out as the bride of, of Jesus on his way to the cross. That's a great analogy. Thing happens on the way to the cross. Remember, this is picking up sign one, two, and this is on the way to the cross. So Rob said, um, he thought uh, that part about her proclaiming him as Christ is part of this wedding imagery, that religion for us is a wedding. So it's the lover who can say, Jesus is the Christ. Um, not an ecclesial authority. Um, and Jesus is on his way to the cross. If he's on the way to the cross, and he can do this to Lazarus, then that claim that why don't you raise yourself or save yourself would be more um, in the front of their minds that he's already raised Lazarus from the dead, that he wouldn't actually have to die on the cross. Yeah. So, you know, if he raised Lazarus, why couldn't he save himself? Mm -hmm. But he's not here to save us from death. Quite the opposite. He's here to lead us through death to new life. Lazarus was just resuscitated. He doesn't want to resuscitate us. He wants to bring us to a completely new life. But I do love that imagery of, um, of religion as love. That... Martha proclaims him, you are the Christ, because that's what a lover gets insight. All the great insights come from a lover. I know this sounds kind of strange, I meant this, but um, people say, well, I know this is just my opinion, you can be wrong, but I, I've heard, like, well, the problem with the Catholic Church is that women aren't given full power. No, not arguing that. Women, I think, should have more power in the Catholic Church, but the real power is not ecclesial power. The real power is to be a lover of Christ. Does, does that make any sense? Like, um, John's kind of making that mystical point. That's where you want to go. And this happened in Bethany, and I just want to mention this. This happened in Bethany. Um, also, you know, like, um, Bethany means something. For the Essene community, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, they didn't have a lot of women. There's only three graves of women. It was mostly men. So that meant men had to do the work of the women. And remember at the Last Supper where Jesus says, you'll see a man carrying a water jug? If we were ancient Jews, you'd be like, what? <laughs> Why would a man be doing women's work? Um, it, yeah, it implies Jesus can see the future. But it's also this reference to the kind of this Essene community. Bethany was, which means house of the poor, uh, was also the center of kind of diaconal service of care for the poor by the Essene communities. The Essenes despised wealth. They believed the temple was corrupt. And so they dedicated themselves to prayer, constant prayer, and care of the poor. 
And the historian Josephus somehow notes that Bethany, uh, oh, sorry, he notes, I'll read it. They give all their possessions to the community, so nobody has any personal uh, possessions. They carry nothing on their journey except a weapon for self-defense, and in each place, somebody is in charge of distributing food and clothing for the poor. Bethany was one of those places where Mary Martha is, but um, also when, when he says um, a man carrying a water jar, maybe where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper was an Essene house for the poor. Kind of like a, like a St. Vincent de Paul, they have a conference room. Um, it's like a St. Vincent de Paul center. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, uh, anyhow, I just kind of like that. Now, the rising of Lazarus uh, from the dead, the Jews are going to see uh, this as a complete threat because who can stop them now? So um, this is when, you know, they used to be wanting to stone him before. This is when they came to the clear decision, he must die. Mm -hmm. He's too powerful. Mm -hmm. so, I just added it. so that's number seven. But I guess um, <coughs> my question of reflection, if we had time, was going to be this. So sometimes you see who Christ is when you have to defend your faith. In sign number seven, Sometimes you can see the presence of Christ in how people die. Maybe death, not just look at that. Maybe death is this great conversion experience where you see Christ. Are uh, anybody dying here? <laughs> we did have uh, this woman, girl, woman, who was, um, this happened a couple of years ago, uh, driving from back to Boise, and as she was passing through Grangeville, well, between Cottonwood and Grangeville, she gets in an accident and is thrown through the window. And she said, I think I died. I said, why do you think you died? She says, well, I was thrown through the windshield and um, her mother was in the car. And um, she said, all of a sudden there, there was this fog and I saw all these people and they're coming to me. And she said, I wasn't in pain anymore. And she said, all of a sudden I heard my mother scream and I turned to look at my mother, and suddenly I wasn't there anymore with all the people. I was back on the road and in intense pain and seeing my mother cry. But like, she's absolutely sure that was um, like this experience that for a teenage girl, wow, maybe there is more than, you know what I mean? <laughs> There's so. a lot of people and a lot of books out there about people who have died. and I have Thousands, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I got a meeting, so um, sorry I didn't really get through meal number seven, but next week we're going to finish up with death and resurrection. So thank you for coming. Thank you.